Hello everybody and welcome to tonight's Architects Bookshop Isolation Talk. We have Philip Arnold here tonight and I'm just looking at who, where everyone is from and it's amazing to see where everyone's from. We've got Madrid, Spain, we've got um, Warsaw, we've got Crown Street, Surrey Hills for the Jilla team, Wentworth Falls, um, Dark Side, which I'm assuming means the north side of the bridge. So welcome to everybody, it's exciting to have you here. Um, we're getting close towards the end of our isolation series. I promised that I'd do them until we came out of isolation. It seems that we are starting to come out of isolation, so we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks. But we still have another few um, organised. Tonight, though, we have um, Philip Arnold. Let me just bring Philip up to say hello to everybody. Hello, Philip. How are you? Hi. Philip comes all the way from literally across the street from where I sit. So if you if you literally look that way from my screen, literally I'm looking at the back of Philip's head <laughs> out that window. It's pretty funny. Um, he is a compatriot who works in Crown Street in Surrey Hills, lives in Crown Street in Surrey Hills. Um, and how did we meet, Philip? On the street, I think. I don't really remember. I think actually it was because I work in one of your buildings, one of the buildings you designed, and I think the day we met, the building owner was painting the awning a colour that neither of us liked. Oh, okay. Do I don't remember that. That, that sounds oh, yeah. likely, though. You were huffing and puffing, and I was huffing and puffing, and I kind of asked you why you were huffing and puffing. You said, because I designed the building and I hate the colour they're painting it. And I said, well, I hate it too, so let's talk to him. <laughs> okay. Gotta love it, eh? <laughs> I don't remember that, but it sounds true. Yeah, good. How's it been for you in isolation? Well... Fine. Um, I mean, um, I work from home normally and work on my own normally, and I've got an office out the back of the house. So my partner's at home. Um, she's sitting in the room at the moment, but uh, she's not working in the office. She's working in the house, which is a good thing because we think we'd drive one another insane. <laughs> That's, I think the whole of Australia is a bit like that, isn't it? And, and throw, throw school kids into the, into the mix, and then I think people are going slightly crazy. Yeah, so we're very lucky. Very lucky. Nice to have it in the same, uh, to, be in, uh, to be able to work from home easily. Yes. So we'll talk a little bit about why I've asked Philip to come um, while he transitioned across to his slides. But in essence, Philip, uh, as I said, Philip works across the road from my office. Uh, he designed the office we worked in, that we work in, and we now have as our office space. Uh, Philip was at Zahn's Associates for 15 years, straight out of university as a student, and then um, went to work for BKH for a couple of years before then starting his own practice, which is Plus and Minus Design. He's also there probably more famously, well, not more famously, but equally famously known for his um, lecturing. He's taught across architecture, interiors, and history for probably 20 years. And pretty much everybody that comes into the bookshop says, oh my God, I've just been to this amazing lecture by Philip Arnold about blah, blah. Um, and I always feel a bit ripped off that I've never been to one of those lectures by Philip Arnold, having been educated in Victoria, not New South Wales. Um, so Philip is at the moment adjunct professor at Western Sydney Uni, and he obviously has his own practice. So Philip, over to you, and um, I'm looking forward to tonight. So it's up oh. over to you, Philip. Good. There we are. Okay. So um, uh, hello to everyone. Um, hello to Ireland and Denmark, South Africa, maybe even Texas and Brazil, although. Um, the time difference is a little bit of a problem, um, obviously. Um, just before we get started, I grew up in um, Gamangia country, which I'm embarrassed to say I didn't really know when I was growing up. So I think that welcome to country is a really fabulous thing. All of my work, um, except for this one, which is in Hampshire in the UK, it's a building that I've never seen, is on Yora, Kuringai or Darug country, which is around the Sydney area for those not from Sydney. Um, I was wondering why Adam invited me to uh, give a talk, but I think it's because I buy a lot of books. Um, and so here's a shot of um, part of our library in the in the front room of our house. You'll see a little bit more of the house a little bit later. You, you but before kept, um, kept us afloat. For and a thanks to um, Adam for inviting me on. I thought that I would mention a few. Um, sorry, someone calling me. Thought I would mention a. Uh, a few books during the lecture. And I wanted to talk about this little project first, which is one of my favorite projects in the last um, 25 years by Lakaton and Vassal. 
um, which is in, in a, a small square in Bordeaux. And this is a photograph of the finished product and another photograph of the finished product. When they were writing about, their, about this project, they say, the square is beautiful, there's no deteriorating situation, there's no need for indispensable works. As a project, we've merely proposed some simple and rapid maintenance works, replacing the gravel, cleaning the ground surface more often, trimming the lime trees, etc. sufficient for improving the, the use of the square and for satisfying the residents. Now, I think that's kind of fantastic and kind of almost in a funny way, an anti-architectural way that most of us think about architecture, actually doing almost nothing. There's no, there's nothing um, especially, uh, there are no grand gestures, there's no signature of the architect on the job. It's just doing as little as, as little as is necessary. And I think that that's a really lovely thing to do. I also really love the idea of budget being left over to um, do arboreal work on the trees. Um, that project was in this 2G from some time ago. Unfortunately, it's not in this issue of Lacaton and Vassal, which is temporarily out of stock, but maybe Adam can sort something out in the next month or so while the bookshop's still open. So this is the building that um, I worked on with Alex Arnas and Peter Reid, which, uh, which is where Adam has his office. I think Adam's only on the top floor, but maybe the top two floors. I can't quite recall. I haven't seen the new fit out Top two. since it's in too much detail since it's been completed. So this building was from a while ago, from about 1995, and it was done while I was working um, at Sarnas Associates. This is the view out the back door of my office. So you can actually see how close we are to one another. And so this is the view angle that Adam and I would have from one another, although I hope it's kind of obvious we can't actually see one another. So this is a photograph of um, my office from the lane. I'm on the right. The neighbouring building was done by TACT, um, by Brent and Katerina. Um, and uh, this is another view of our office. And that I'm behind that grill that's up the top there, which is actually uh, a grate, which is piggery flooring um, that we've repurposed as a privacy screen. Means that I have very good vision out of through the window, but nobody can see me, at least in daylight hours. Um, I've used that kind of that piggery grill in another little job in Surrey Hills um, where we've used it as a privacy, privacy and security screen at the front. So these are a few photographs of it. Um, the job in question was uh, to take um, a, an existing basement with a shop level above it and turn it into an apartment, which is, this is a photograph of the, it's actually during construction, not before construction, but not real glamorous. So what we did was we put a living room in the basement area so that we've got cross ventilation to and from these kind of snorkel um, spaces at, at either end of the plan and then have the bedrooms above. So this is that um, this is the area just inside the facade, which drops down into the living room below. And that doorway is through to one of the deep window reveals to the front bedroom. So this is the plan up the top. So two bedrooms at the back and one bedroom at the front. And then this is the level of the, the level below. So this is looking up into that void um, and then just walking down into the void. And here we've got the piggery grill again. I think this is actually the only time that I've done that since our place. Although um, we are actually hoping to use it again on a job that I'm building at the moment in Glebe. Um, this is how the apartment turned out downstairs. Unfortunately, I've never seen it furnished, um, but uh, I'm pretty happy. I'd be very happy living in a space like this. The beautiful thermal mass, obviously, so not much temperature change. These photographs were taken by um, Jason Lamb, who unfortunately isn't taking photos anymore, or not professionally. So this is a job that I finished a little while ago. Um, beautiful photographs by Catherine Liu. Um, I like working with different photographers. Um, you'll see some photographs tonight from Catherine Liu, Ben Guthrie, Mary Gordon, Anthony Browell and Prue Rusco. And um, like working with new pho um, photographers each time. Two, so mine's the black one in the middle and two houses to the right is a job by Sam Marshall. Um, it's in a beachside suburb but it's not a very glamorous site. It has no views, it's on a busy street, it has lots of neighbours. So this is where it is in relation to the beach, and this is what it looks like. It is quite a suburban setting. 
This is what the house looked like when uh, before we started work. Um, so, and here is it, it is in context with the busy street out the front, a big rise over the site. It's a big flat area out the back, but it's about 5.7 metres off the street. Um, and lots of neighbours. So the existing house wasn't glamorous, as you'll see shortly. I approached it like I approached all of my jobs of how much can we keep um, rather than let's just knock it over. Um, and I approach it that way for environmental reasons as well as budget reasons. But when the engineer and I had a bit of a look at it, um, Damien Hadley and I had a look at it, it really was like a museum of dodgy buildings. There were walls that were six or 700 millimetres thick where we couldn't work out what was going on. We think that each time there was some kind of structural issue, um, a home handyman would just build a new wall in front of the old one. So we couldn't work out how it was standing up. There was lots of, lots of too much rectification to do, so we did demolish it. So this is what it looked like. This is And this is some of the photographs before. This big level yard out the back was at once a working market garden in the middle of um, Bronte until quite recently. And these are a few photographs of the existing condition from the real estate website, hence the good photography. Um, so we were given a reasonable budget for a four bedroom house based on what quantity surveyors have been telling me. Unfortunately, the brief was different to that. It was for a five bedroom house, a three car garage, six meters of excavation because of the fall, um, a vehicular turntable because we're on a busy street, so we wanted nose in, nose out access, a pool, and another three bedroom house. So the two things didn't quite meet, but what we were able to do by working very hard was to give everything that they wanted except for the pool for their budget. So we had to think carefully about our brief. Here's the strategic brief. We wanted to maximise the development potential, satisfy, satisfy the client requirements with any surplus space from the maximum development potential being allocated to a second house. The client liked the strategy, I liked the strategy, the consultants were on board, but most importantly, the banks liked the strategy. And as, a, as far as a material brief goes, we had no luxurious materials to try and meet the budget, no stone, no architectural steel, limited timber work, concrete only when it was cost effective, so certainly no off-form concrete walls, plywood cladding on the outside, plasterboard on the inside, lots of MDF, lots of laminate, um, then the, the brief, the design brief was to no crafted details, so nothing very fine, really direct detailing to try and keep the budget as low as possible. We needed to get the layout right, get the scale right, get the proportions right, and that's what we were aiming for. But all of this required quite a lot of discipline, discipline from both the client and myself, but actually mostly the client because all of the things that were on their wish list couldn't necessarily be afforded. You know, things like um, wall hung um, uh, toilets with uh, a concealed systems, that just wasn't going to happen, not in that budget. So the brief was to provide not more for less and to be modest and appropriate. So this is how we started. This is where we end up. This is a montage, just so that I can toggle quickly and easily between before and after. Um, a few elevations and sections. So we divided the two houses with the uh, the family out the back with the northern orientation, which is where the, the sun is, and um, a second house facing the busy street. Um, ground floor has mostly parking and also bedrooms for the front dwelling. Upstairs, we've got um, uh, bedrooms at the back for the rear dwelling and a, the master bedroom and living spaces overlooking the street for the front dwelling. And then above that, we've got a big level that opens onto the rear yard with a guest bedroom. So to start from the street, you enter up a driveway. This is the, one of the bedrooms from downstairs. So we only had limited openings to the street because of the noise. Um, put the uh, cupboards above the window so they didn't show up in the FSR diagrams. Stair going to upstairs, just plasterboard and off-form concrete, nothing glamorous. Um, these two big windows overlooking the street are double glazed, again, because of the noise. 
The kitchen is largely made out of, out of laminate, even the bench top, just with uh, um, plywood covered fronts up the top and a, and a courtyard, quite a sunny courtyard, but mostly in the afternoon. And then all of the doors open so that you have the full living space opening onto the courtyard. There's the courtyard the division between front and back dwelling and then the double glazed windows. This is the courtyard looking back towards the, uh, the family's house. Going back down the stairs, we come into the garage space, which has something that I've always wanted to do, a, um, a foil ceiling. So we needed to insulate the underside of the slab, which is something that I wanted to do since seeing a picture of, um, of Sigurd Lurens's last workplace in, um, in Lund, um, which, um, and uh, Lurens also used a foil ceiling in his little flower kiosk in Malmo. So it's something that I've always wanted to do, but always, clients balk at the idea of having exposed sarking. Now, uh, those photographs, or the first photograph, was from this book, which is temporarily, temporarily out of stock from the architect's bookshop, but you might still be able to order it, and it's a cracker. So this is the big garage area. So officially for three cars, but you can obviously fit more in there, but it's also fantastic um, outdoor play space when the kids are um, when it's raining and the kids want somewhere to play, and it's got a big turntable on the in, on the in the middle of it, which the client, which the kids also love to play with until their parents got uh, understood what they were doing, and discouraged them from using it. So going up the side stair, we come to um, the, really the front door of the weird rear dwelling, one level up, and then we go up another stair to this big room at the back. So you come up from this space in the middle where the painting is. Um, and then this is the level which opens out onto the big yard and all of the doors open up outside of the opening um, so that you can't see the doors when they're in the open position. So full opening onto a deck that's at the same level as the floor inside. This is looking back in the other direction. Again, quite a cheap kitchen. I think because this is the main house, we put some veneer in here, but everything else is laminate, including the bench tops. This is the house in the evening and then with the doors open. So you can see where they're opening on the sides there. So they're using the side setback so that you can get a clear opening to the yard. Um, this is leaving the job again and uh, on to the next job. I'm trying to move a little bit quickly because I've got quite a lot of things to get through and I'm already running out of time. So this is a little restaurant that I did a little while ago. Um, it uh, was by the people who had Moon Park, which was described by one of the owners as being the second best Korean restaurant at uh, its address in Redfern. Um, uh, and these were the chefs on the right and the manager on the, on the left. So they became my clients and took over the Burke Street Bakery site um, in Potts Point, which had been designed by um, Don McWalter um, a while before. So here are some of the photographs that Don McWalter gave me of his original fit out with some famous architects sitting in the front there um, and McWalter's drawings or the drawings from Meacham Knuckles McWalter. So our approach was to do as little as possible, but as much as necessary. So we wanted to reuse the existing fit out. We wanted to get the layout right, do some acoustic treatment, convert the counter to a bar, screen the kitchen, supplement the lighting, reuse uh, furniture that my clients already had and get the color right. So to reuse the existing fit out, we wanted to do that because the existing fit out was really good. It was high quality. It was very well designed. So it's, um, we just needed to tweak it a little, a little bit to, to suit new requirements. All of the work, the, all of the work was to be reversible. The, and that is because now the restaurant has closed and it's gone back to be a bake to being a bakery, which, um, um, we're really sad about. Now, not making changes, I think, is a design choice. Not making design changes is a sustainable choice. And the need for novelty is not good enough reason to gut a, rest a good fit out and replace it with something new. So I've just got a few photographs that show the Meacham Knuckles McWalter scheme on the left and the, uh, the results of the, of the change on the right from more or less the same angles. So we removed very, very, very little of the um, of the bakery fit out to change it.
So we, to get the layout right, the license that existed, the liquor license, determined the patron numbers. We use the front section as a bar, the middle section where we've got good acoustic treatment for groups and had an intimate section at the back for smaller groups. So here's the front bit, the bar, the middle bit where the acoustic attenuation is good and the more intimate bit out the back and all of that bunkette seating was part of the original fit out. Acoustic treatment. Um, I told my clients that I wouldn't do any design until they had acoustic advice except for the layout. The acoustic specification drives the design treatment of the space. Um, the space is buzzy when it's busy, it's not irritating, and you can hear people at your own table. I was kind of a little bit surprised that patrons would notice this, to be honest. Um, I'm, I think that they would just find it to be a pleasing space to be in. These are some of the reviews that we got. And it was clear that people were actually paying attention to the acoustics because as a lot of you would know, uh, a lot of restaurants in Sydney, the acoustics are not good. But we did have one complaint, which is somebody who wasn't happy that she was able to listen to the people who were sitting next to her. Here is some of the acoustic treatment. So we've got um, a kind of sponge on the wall and being held in place by these battens. And this is what the overall space looks like. We needed to convert the front pastry counter into a bar. So, it, but we also had to re retain the existing counter. So we had no fixings into the counter so that the bar could be entirely removed. And the counter was also at the wrong height for a bar. It really bothers me when you sit at a bar somewhere and it's just at the wrong height and you've got your elbows, your, um, elbows up around your ears. So we didn't want it to be comfortable for dining and we did want to have hooks for um, jackets and handbags and the like. So here is my initial sketches of the bar, which are pretty obviously inspired by Paula Mendes de Rojas' work. Uh, and here's a plug for another book to order from Adam. So these are the drawings that I sent across to the engineer. And his reaction was, yeah, it's not going to work. But he said that he'd do a computer model of it to see if it would work, and it did. Um, we sent the drawings across to the steel fabricator and Mario said, are you sure it's going to stand up? And I said, well, the engineer said it would. Here are some of the photographs of the bar in the workshop um, under production, photographs by the metal worker. So I'm really pleased with how it turned out. But there was also a video attached to that which had um, the fabricator knock one end of the bar and it just kept, the bar just kept wobbling for minutes. You can hear him in the background saying, yeah, glass is going to fall right off of that. But when we fixed it in place, it didn't. It was quite, it was quite sturdy. So here are some of the studies just to make sure that it is going to be a comfortable spot to dine at, to sit at and have a drink, or to stand at and have a drink. And there are the coat hooks. And this is what the bar looks like. So it's all out of mild steel, which you can't and probably shouldn't really do in Sydney. But uh, Genevieve Lilly gave me a hint of you can seal it with beeswax. And the restaurateurs found it to be quite easy to seal it frequently with the beeswax. And there wasn't any rust while it was being properly maintained as a restaurant. But I am concerned now that it's back as a bakery. They're not doing that quite as well as they probably should, and rust is beginning to appear. So we did want to screen the kitchen because the kitchen's a noise source. We wanted to cut the view into the kitchen, wanted to provide a waiter's station and provide a view from the waiter's station. So this is what it, <clears throat> this is what it looked like when it was in as a bakery. And then we put this screen in front of it with the waiter's station. We used acro props so that um, it would be reversible, although that seems like a funny decision since they did actually bolt it into the fitter, which they weren't really supposed to do. So this is what the screen ended up looking like. So we wanted to reuse the existing lighting because again, the lighting was good. We wanted to use the counter as a light source, which didn't work as a while, but worked for a while, but did ultimately test the performance and then supplement the lighting as required. So we did put more down lights in the middle section. Um, the client also got an offer for some very nice um, Leclint pendants, which we installed. So here's some of the lighting. The wall light there is from the original fit out, 
we've just put the cutouts of the battens around it. Original lighting. And then the Le Clint pendant, which worked very nicely with the, the uh, name of the restaurant being um, Paper Bird. So again, very happy with how that turned out. Um, it was down off a side street in Potts Point, so it wasn't especially visible, but once you did see it, I think it looks very inviting from the street. We wanted to reuse the furniture. When it, they had chairs from Tonnet from the last restaurant, and we were going to supplement them with some bar stools from Tonnet and reuse their existing table bases with new tops cut to size. So this is the chair that they told me that they had. It's the chair that I recall them having, and I really love it. It's a very comfortable chair, chair designed not very long ago by um, Herman Czech, um, who also designed the Kleinus Cafe that was a reference for our restaurant. But I really love um, Herman Czech's um, work and love his way of thinking about things. So there is a story that someone who was looking for, the, for that cafe, the Kleinus Cafe, architects doing some architectural sightseeing, went into the cafe to ask them where it was. Um, Herman Czech says that architecture shouldn't be a nuisance, that the coffee house guest doesn't have to notice everything, it could always have been like this, but that anyone who wants to should time and again to be able to discover things. This is a really, for me, a really lovely way of thinking about architecture. It not being conspicuous, but it being of high quality, and I love the idea of people spotting new details each time they visit, rather than a kind of instantly consumable architecture where all of the ideas are visible in, in the first visit. So another plug for the bookshop, see if you can get a copy of this. I got my copy through the Architects Bookshop and they were also stocking um, some of Herman Czech's essays, which I haven't bought yet and probably should. Here is, here's a photograph that I found on Pinterest in it in summer because we were there in, in winter when we were last there or when it was cold. So I did all of these lovely drawings showing the beautiful Herman Czech chairs making sure that the whole fit out would work, seeing how everything was going to be assembled. But we found out that they didn't actually have the Herman Czech chairs. They had these one instead, which are the Horgen Glaurus classic chairs, which are world famous in Switzerland, apparently. Um, these are the Tonnet bar stools that we added in, and this is how it all looks. Now, I'm a big fan of Tonnet furniture. It's not terribly expensive. It is repairable. It can easily be replaced. Um, we wanted to get the colour right. So again, the um, Kleinus Cafe by Czech was a reference and actually all of Herman Czech's cafes and restaurants um, are really wonderful. Um, but we were also inspired by the Chung Dok Gong Palace in, um, in Seoul um, and, the, and the, uh, the Dan Chong traditional painting in, in Korea. So the restaurant itself, wasn't a Korean restaurant as such, but it was heavily driven by, by Korean cooking. Um, but the, uh, my clients didn't want it to be too conspicuous an Asian restaurant. So they wanted any reference to, to Korea to be fairly subtle. We also needed to get the greens just right. This is the Kleinus Cafe, and, but using this photograph of um, the um, Chong Dok Gong Palace. I took this photograph down to Bunnings, the local hardware store, to try and match these greens. I was really confident that I'd done a really nice job. Took it back to the office, painted it on a tank, uh, on, on a sample of timber, and it looked terrible. So I gave um, uh, Sonia Fandaha a call, and she prepared this wonderful scheme. Now, too many wonderful things that she did. Rather than using one green everywhere, she actually proposed four greens through the, through the entire job. But the main green that she used, I actually compared it to my original sample, and they looked very, very similar, except that my sample looked terrible and hers looked really wonderful. So it was such a good experience working with Sonia, and I think that she really made the space into something really special. I think my, my green would have been okay, but a bit flat, whereas it really, really um, hummed along in, in the, the greens that, that Sonia proposed. And unexpectedly, it did become a little bit of a device for promoting the restaurant. 
Um, so a lot of their own photographs were taken against this backdrop. A lot of people who visited the restaurant photographed their meals against this backdrop. So a bit of an Instagram success. And this is my favourite photograph from the Instagram feeds. Um, moving on to another job, um, that big yellow wall on the left was also um, the colour was uh, chosen with Sonia again. Um, so we were trying to design this one not as an architectural object that you look at, but as a device from which you enjoy the gardens, somewhere that you look from. So this is a view of the house, but Mary Garden, who took the photograph, is standing on in the garden on the other side of the pool, and it's not really some... I don't think it's really something that you stand back and look at. This is a view from the street. So it's not an architectural, an important architectural object, but this is the view from the house of the garden, which I think is actually much more important. So the, the, in this case, the, um, the, the, the two very large fig trees were existing, um, but all of the, uh, most of the other landscaping is new. And from every room in the house, you get little glimpses of the garden or giant vistas of the garden. So my clients actually did something that I think more clients should do is that they actually got me involved when they were looking at buying the house and said, what do you think? Well, the house was the, the result of a subdivision from a larger estate. The original house was from 1963 and was a project home, not very high quality. It had had renovations done in 87 and more renovations done in 96, which were a little bit slapdash to solve particular problems, but not done in a particularly beautiful way. This was the existing lower level plan with the, the garage on the right there and the upper level plan. So nothing very elegant about the plan, so especially it, the house had no backyard. Um, because of the rise off the street, which was a five metre rise, the entire front yard was dominated by this very steep driveway, um, a pool area, and all of this soft landscaping was quite steep on the topography and really inaccessible. So even though there was a front yard that was nearly 400 square metres, there was really only about 30 square metres of um, open space for, for kids to run around in. Um, upstairs, we had one living room that faced north and faced the view and looked into the tree. So again, north is important in the southern hemisphere. Um, so this is the view to the north. But actually, the doors were designed in a way that meant that you didn't really look out of out through them. The terrace outside was actually too narrow for you to properly furnish. Most of the other living rooms on the top space looked towards the south, looked to the to this tiny little um, rear yard. So weren't actually taking advantage of the site very much. There was a giant space in the middle of it that um, was filled up with a gone with the wind staircase, which on the ground floor actually obstructed your access to a big part of the plan. Somebody didn't do their head clearance diagrams properly. So the negatives of the site was that there was effectively no yard. It was a poor response to the orientation and the planning of the house was actually quite bizarre. But there were positives. There was really good orientation available. The mature fig trees were just a gift. There are actually views of the of the of Sydney Harbour, but the view into the canopy of the fig trees is much better. And it had an existing structure, which means that we didn't have to build it again, which had big impact, big um, opportunities for the budget. So this is the upper level plan before. This is what we ended up with, and this is a diagram that just shows the limited number of structural changes that we made. So the demolitions in red and the uh, and the uh, the new bits of structure in blue. So we were really trying, Damien, um, Damien the engineer and I were again trying very, very hard to minimize the amount of work on the structure so that we could spend money elsewhere. So we did take off about a quarter of the roof just to raise it to improve the relationship between the main living space and the view, and the, the view into the trees. And then downstairs, this is the amount of structural changes that we made. So really, really quite minimal, but a, quite a radical transformation of the plan, a radical improvement in my opinion.
So why do we retain, retain the existing structure? It was larger than required. So it wasn't an additions and alterations job. It was a subtractions and alterations job. These are the bits that we demolished on the upper level. It's good for the environment to retain the existing structure because we're not transferring embodied energy of the existing structure into landfill. And obviously it's good for the budget, which ended up being well below market rates for building work in the eastern suburbs. The savings allowed for substantial site works and allowed for a mature new garden. So we had the pool, which we moved over to here. We moved the garage from the upper level to a street level garage so that we could get rid of the driveway. Um, we used the old driveway as a, as a big covered outdoor space associated with this new swimming pool. And this is this area here, looking back towards the swimming pool. And there are glimpses of the pool when you come up the stair from the garage and from the front door. Um, we built a big new retaining wall along the edge of the driveway. So we use the existing structure of the driveway to make sure that in building this big retaining wall very close to the, uh, to the mature trees that we weren't going to damage the roots. So we put piles down in between roots and then built a beam on top of the existing driveway so that we're making sure that we're not transferring any loads from new structure onto the roots of the trees, which would be a, obvious, a pretty obvious problem. So this is the retaining wall from the street. And that retaining wall allows us to massively, to introduce this big garden podium at the same level as the lower level of the house. So we went from having a um, soft landscaping in the front yard of just under 100 square metres to um, uh, nearly, well, a 259% increase in soft landscaping area. We increased the useful yard from 30 square metres to about 186, increasing it about sixfold. And I'm going really slowly. Living areas on the ground floor, opening onto the, onto the garden and and another more private and dark room out the back so that you can watch somewhere where you can watch TV with mediated views to the garden and a guest bedroom for very long-term guests, frequent long-term guests. So just to walk up through the house, this is from the street. So here's a view showing what the podium looks like, the front gate going up, up a staircase through this podium, through the landscape podium. So you're popping out it up into this into this landscaped podium with a, a relationship of the stair to the swimming pool and to the garden on, a, on either side of the, of the stair from the garage. In through the front door, a nice vestibule, that's the, uh, the rumpus room on the lower level, but the main, which can be cut off from the main entrance, but the main living spaces are upstairs. So at the top of the stair, you have a quick glimpse into the rear garden. There's a little control point desk at the top of the stair and a nice big living space that opens out onto the terrace. So we've got different sorts of living rooms on the top floor, the main room, but then also a, another quiet study and a, a separate kitchen. So this is the study and the kitchen. The client wanted a separate kitchen from the living and dining spaces, which is a little bit unusual in Australia these days but we did have a little connection through a big joinery unit with little glimpses from the dining room back into the kitchen. Um, open to the south and to the north so that you can get good cross ventilation. And the doors open a little bit, but can also slide entirely out of the opening a little bit like we did in Bronte. Sorry. I'm getting criticism from inside the room. So nice big, um, big space, but maybe a little bit too large when you're counting the terrace. So we floated this wall in a skylight in the middle of the space. So again, designed with, um, with Damien Hadley and very pleased with how that turned out. So here are a few views of that floating wall. So it's a, and obviously inspired by Mies van der Rohe, um, but also by Julian Lumpens and um, uh, Villanova Artigas. I love that wall, Philip. Which, oh, the, the Artigas wall. wall. I love your wall. 
Oh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with it too. <laughs> Beautiful. So, again, a few plugs for some books on, on Mises collages, um, Julian Lumpen's and Ategas's book, but I think it's going to be quite hard to find now. A few more views of this wall. So you can't look directly into the, the dining room, so there's the opportunity of kind of revealing a set dining table, which I really loved. So the house was larger, the, larger than we were required, but we had lots of living spaces, so I was encouraging the client to try and learn to live a little bit like a cat. So to change rooms as the weather changes, to change rooms as the season change, to change rooms as your mood changes. Um, don't organise your rooms according to use. Not every space needs to be alike and not every room needs to do everything. So it's good to have some rooms that are very bright. It's good to have some rooms that are, are a little bit more cosy. So each room to have its own character. So just leaving the house a little bit. And just wanted to bring up a little bit of a vulgar issue, which I'll rush through. It's especially vulgar talking about a project in Bellevue Hill, which is a pretty expensive suburb in Sydney. But one of my favourite client briefs ever, not from this client, was, but it applies to this project and to all projects, was he said, you know all of those details that architects get really excited about but no one else can see? I don't want any of those. And it was a really beautiful brief, I think, because I think we can get obsessed about our own little thing and do maybe a little bit too much craftiness that sometimes can make things a little bit unaffordable. So back to thinking about budget. It was a large house. Um, it was a multi -gen It is a multi-generational house. They do have long-term guests. The client didn't want to overinvest. They had lots of friends or they have they had friends who believe they may have overinvested in architecture. Um, so we triaged the brief to stretch the budget with modest finishes, veneer joinery where it was important with the accents of colour, which is really just paint. And actually the client has repainted the hanging wall, but I figure it can change well as often as they think that they need a, a change in mood. We did actually prepare a whole lot of colour color studies for them. I'm still a big fan of the yellow. Stretching the budget also allowed us to spend money on the garden, which is often an area where, where money is sacrificed in, with a lot of houses at the end of the job. We had, and it, giving money to the garden was important by, and allowed us to increase the soft landscaping and increase the, significantly increase the amount of usable yard. It isn't an inexpensive house, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it is well below common square metre rates for Eastern Sydney. And we think it's kind of appropriate. Um, going on to something that's in a, is just around the corner, but a very, very different type of house. Um, how much of a problem, Adam, is it that I'm going over time? I think it's, com I think it's completely fine and fantastic. Okay, sorry if anyone needs to go. Um, Another time. Everyone's, everyone's hanging in there. There's, we've got 350 viewers, so it's all good. Okay, cool. So this is Kalean, which was designed for um, Charles Burton Fairfax, um, who was uh, one of the, the Fairfax family owned the Sydney Morning Herald, so quite an established family. Um, uh, Fairfax employed Harry Kent, who is a local architect and worked for Blackett and Horbury Hunt. And uh, Harry Kent did quite remarkable houses elsewhere in, or projects elsewhere in Sydney. Um, but then uh, Fairfax went on his honeymoon to London and while he was in London met Morris Adams and also employed Adams to work on the same house. So in Sydney you had Harry Kent working on the house and in London also Morris Adams working on the same house. So there was a little bit of a dispute who, about who the author is but it's commonly understood that Kent did the plans and Adams did the details. So here are some of um, Adams's etchings of the house. And most of those details were implemented. So this is the existing plan, the original plan, the modifications that we made. What I was trying to do is to, the house is, the house is obviously remarkable. So I wanted to keep my, I, I thought that I'm mostly successful if the interventions that I make are invisible or not especially visible but make the house comfortable. 
So just running through a few pictures of the house. Uh, there was a lot of restoration work with um, Sandlick Constructions, um, general repairs and maintenance, upgrading of the electrical and plumbing, rising dam, air conditioning, etc. Um, and but we were able to turn the old kitchen and servants' quarters in the back onto the on the ground floor into a modern kitchen and open family room that opens out onto the pool area. We didn't remove the old butler's pantry, which. I would love to have been able to keep, but it had been removed at the latest sometime in the 1980s. So all of this area had already been fairly heavily modified. So this is the views of that new family area out the back. Changed the bathrooms. Extended the veranda, but introduced a little ha-ha to the pool so that we could have the pool fence lower down so that the top of the pool fence is at knee height relative to the garden, relative to the terrace, sorry. And then big covered doors that open out onto the terrace so that you can leave your doors open when it's when there's light rain and to try and cut down some of the sun a little bit. So here you can see the, the relative height relationship of the pool fence to the existing terrace. This was the old pool fence and this is what it was changed to. So you can just see the, well, I can just see the glass fence on the left there. We also rebuilt the garage. Rushing upstairs, did a lot of restoration work, changed the bathrooms over. These were the principal bathroom uh, bedrooms in the, in the house, but there was a requirement for two additional bedrooms. These are, these are the principal bedrooms. So we did two suites essentially to try and make them a little bit equitable to these grand rooms to the kids who occupy these ones so each of the teenagers got a little suite of rooms that had a little sitting room and a, and a bedroom and, and um, a, sometimes a wardrobe so not quite leaving this job there are actually two more projects associated with this job this is one of the earlier owners lady clark arriving at Colleen in her rolls royce which is a little bit unusual because there isn't really a turning circle for a for a car of that size, can because Kambala Road is quite a narrow street. So these were the original gates, and my clients used to keep these gates open all the time because it's a narrow, busy street, and it was difficult to wait there for the gates to open. And what we did was we moved one of those very, very heavy sandstone columns, introduced a palisade fence so that you could pull off the road and moved the gates further up the driveway and hung them off new um, cast iron gate posts. So these are the gates being repaired. And these are the, this was the MDF model made for the new cast iron works. And then the cast iron was done in, um, done in Wagga. This is how they turned out. So I'm very happy with it where most lay people would look at these columns and probably not recognize that they're only a few years old. But anyone who uh, knows what they're looking at would recognise it as being contemporary work. So we did have a new, I've just finished another project on the same site. Um, uh, the client required a home gymnasium. Um, so we had all, the heritage listing on the property has the house listed. It has the gates listed, so we've we've played around with the house, we've moved the gates around, all with council's consent, obviously, but there were also five trees on the site which were all individually listed in the heritage listing. So we were looking for a spot to put a garden pavilion um, or a little gymnasium, so we tried something next to the tennis court, didn't like it because you'd be looking out of the house directly at it, not symmetrical with the house, if symmetrical with the tennis court, Tried putting it up the back there, didn't really work as well, too close to the existing house, crowding in on it a little bit. So we actually decided to put it here. If you can't see it, that's a good thing, but it's down in the bottom, um, bottom left there, just inside the gates. Um, and entirely inside the, uh, the tree protection zone of the five listed trees. <laughs> so this is the plan of our little gymnasium. 
So we really tried to articulate it so that we weren't looking at large walls um, of the gym and also tried to wrap them around the trees and came quite close to the trunks. We worked closely with the, the um, structural engineer and the arborist to find a system that would work. Uh, the, the house also can be turn, turned from a home gym into a little apartment in, at some future stage. So working with the engineer, we put piles underneath a transfer slab but made sure that we could move the piles around as required, depending on where the roots eventually ended up being. Now, this is a photograph of the pavilion of the fence from one of the neighbours. So we decided to clad the entire thing in bronze mirror um, to try and reflect the very established part of the garden. The, the pavilion is actually in that image, just on the left-hand side of the screen behind the palm trees. So there it is again. So from the house, you can see it, but you can't see it. It's a little bit of a predator sort of building, I suppose, in that regard. And quite a luxuriously appointed gym inside. With uh, rubber flooring carefully selected to match the terrazzo. Not really, just as it came. And a skylight looking up into the canopy of the trees. And looking back from the gym, back towards the house. So from the gym, you can see the house. From the house, you can sort of see the gym if you're looking hard enough. So we're really, really happy with how um, it is reflecting the existing landscape. So it's very well disguised um, by, the, by the landscape and by the mirrors reflecting the landscape around it. So there it is again, that's like taken from a few metres away from it. Obviously, there are precedents for this. Robert Morris's work, Dan Graham's work, Doug Gaitkin's more recent work, um, Jim Lambie's work, also Tatiana Bilbao, and there is a book on Tatiana Bilbao still available from the Architects Bookshop, get it now. And also more recently, Madeleine Blanchfield's lovely little pavilion in, in Kangaroo Valley. I was aware of the other precedents before when we were designing the box, but not um, Madeleine's job. But, Actually, it was Jensen Godfin's um, Uvet Landscape Hotel that was a really big um, uh, precedent for our job. Um, I don't have a problem with using precedent, as Pleshnik used to say. There's only a new thing in the only new thing in architecture is indoor plumbing. So, just finishing off on our house. Not long to go, guys. Sorry about going over time. Um, these are this is this is where we live. This is our our kitchen, and it's the biggest room in the house, but it's also the room that gets the most use. A lot of you would know it. This was the plan when we bought the house. We've been here for about 25 years. We've been building for 15 years and it's still going, so we're not going to finish. And this is what we did to it. So uh, this is how we furnish it. And I think the way that a house is furnished is important and how it's used, but we made sure that we can move things around a little bit. We entertain quite a lot. So this is how we usually furnish the back room but we can um, allow dining for up to 10 people. And that does happen quite a lot. Upstairs with the bath in the window of our bedroom. Nice section. We have this undulating, sorry, Adam? Nice section. Yeah, well, we do actually have a two meter level change from, uh, well, two meters from the street to the office level. So it's my office, my office is just there on the right where we're sitting. We're just trying to gradually step up. So this is actually where I'm sitting at the moment, and this is the view through that um, piggery flooring out towards the lane where we can see Adam's office. Oh, uh, Sandra is pointing out to everyone that it's not normally this tidy. <laughs> Certainly not like it at the moment. And this is the garden between the house and this is a view of the house from my office. So 
it is massively, massively overgrown, which means that when we're in the house, we can't see the office, which is a really nice thing for me. Sue Barnsley did this lovely sketch for us, which was absolutely perfect. We gave her a terrible brief because we were, Sandra and I were arguing with one another on what we actually want. And like Sue did, she just managed to resolve every, all of our problems into something that we hadn't imagined that was actually much more beautiful. We were inspired by um, Hank Fieritsen and Anton Schlepper's work at the Priona Tainen in um, outside Schoenslot in um, the Netherlands, um, where he allows the garden to grow over as well. There's one part of his beautiful garden which you can visit, you can actually stay at in some months of the year, where, but there's one part of the garden where he described it as, this is the result of care, 30 years of careful neglect. We were also inspired, inspired by the, the gardens in Suzhou. Um, um, uh, and this is a photograph of the lingering garden. And one of the things that we really like about this is that these pathways through the gardens actually aren't visible from many points. So you're looking onto a thing before you realize that you can walk through it. We have had an experience with people in, our, um, in the back room of our house, architects who are completely shocked to see us walk out into the garden and walk through it. Oops, going the wrong way. I also, this is maybe one of my favourite architectural drawings, even though it's not strictly an architectural drawing, because it's by an architect, but an architect who is much better known as a landscape architect, Geoffrey Jellicoe. And these are the drawings of his, the house that he lived in for 50 years and as it changed over the decades. I love the idea of a house growing with its inhabitants and changing. Now, obviously, a garden is a much more conspicuous way of changing rather than just moving furniture about, but I love the idea that a house can change with you. So this is the view again of the house from the garden, from my office. But we have four gardens around the house. This is the overgrown garden that you've seen. Then we've got a little pond, a pool in the middle of the house so that we're getting light into the front, northern light into the front room, light into the middle of the plan. But also with the little pond there, we can close the back doors off in summer and all of our breezes are coming in a shaded courtyard across water. So it's actually very cool in our house. This is a view of the pond, um, uh, a view from the pond from the roof garden above, which we'll get to in a second. Got a very untidy front yard, which is where we keep our compost bins and a roof garden. So this is the roof garden as it was fairly recently. And the view back towards our bath and bedroom and looking from the roof garden back down into the into the garden below. So very, very over, overgrown. Coming into our house, into our kitchen. Um, this is the our little back step. So we've got um, the garden is seat height above the level of the house. That's just the way that the topography was and we kept it that way. But this little curve um, on the on the bench just underneath the cat was inspired by um, Heinz Bienefeld's work in, in Köln with this. And I wish that I had a photograph of the builders as they were forming this up. We'd used a, um, a bit of form work that's usually used for columns and stretched it horizontally. And after they had braced it all up so that they were pretty confident that it wouldn't move under the con um, after the during the concrete pour, I caught them taking photographs of one another standing on the formwork proudly. Um, Heinz Bienefeld's recent AU is still still may be available through the architect's bookshop. It is Get that it. one. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's he's such a remarkably unknown and such a remarkable architect. So here's a photograph of our kitchen looking back towards our jungle with our, the curtains closed. This is the this is that garden room um, after a dinner party. And this is our front room, which has a completely different character to the, to the back to the back room. So we're not dividing the rooms. It's a little bit like that idea of moving around like a cat. We've got one room in the front, which is dark and cosy and another bright room out the back. So we retreat into this room in winter um, with the fire plate, with the fire on and leave the other room for different times of types of the year, times of the year. Um, it's presently being used by Sandra as her home office. So 
because we don't think we can work together, Sandra's working underneath the stair in the in our living room and I'm still out in the office. So just to try and wind up, what am I actually trying to do? I don't think architecture should always be cheap. I don't think architecture should always be expensive. I'm not interested in funny shapes. I'm not interested in novelty. I'm not interested in glamour. I'm not interested in zeitgeist. I'm not trying to develop a style. I'm just trying to find a re an appropriate response to each job, trying to work out when enough is enough. Sorry, I've gone over time. That's it. Oh, that's beautiful, Philip. Thank you. It was so amazing. Just totally, totally, totally loved that. There was um, lots of um, love coming your way from everybody online, just talking about how great it is and um, the type of work you're doing and the approach you've got to it and the kind of love you give to your work. So thank you. It was really great. Um, I might just bring you up. Just as a bit of a side note, um, I wanted to say that we are um, doing some special orders on books at the moment. So if anybody does have a special order, you know, that book, that perfect book that they've always wanted to have, um, feel free to email us um, hello at thearchitectsbookshop.com.au and we will sort that out for you if we can. Um, uh, Phil, we had Sorry, amazing... Adam, I'm seeing a few comments on the thing saying, uh, saying, um, asking about our house. Look, if anyone's going to be in the Surrey Hills area, especially if they're visiting from overseas, just drop us a line and come by, but do give us some notice. But you're welcome. <laughs> And socially distanced. And socially distanced. Oh, after this, after COVID's all over, obviously. Hey, Sandra, put your face in the screen so we can see you, would you? Come on, we want to see you. Ah, oh, there we go. There's the lovely Sandra. <laughs> I'd wanted to see Philip and Sandra's house for ages, and then my husband went away on holiday, so I invited myself for dinner, didn't I, Philip? Yeah. <laughs> we like... need to have you over for a big dinner. <laughs> you and Michael. Oh, that'd be great. No, thank you. That was really awesome, Philip. It was really, really great. I just love seeing the work. It was so, um, it's so generous. It's so like, you know, obviously generous, generous in the way in which you talk about it. It was really great. I really appreciate it. Good. Love the references too to uh, the work. Like your your knowledge of history of architecture and details of architecture is amazing. I was going to put a lot more in, but I thought it's only, well, I'm already massively over time. So, well, actually, I don't suppose we're that bad. No, you did quite well. You got, you got, you were pretty much on time. It's pretty good. Three minutes past seven. So that's all fine. That's fine. We had people today from Scotland, Russia, England, Spain, New Zealand, and Poland. Okay. So that was pretty good. We had um, 350 people. If you're online, feel free to like us in the YouTube, wherever you can like us, because that's quite good. We like to get a bit of a like. Um, we will finish up now, but just to let you know, make sure you log on tonight across to um, the ABC iView because there's a fantastic documentary on Rick Laplastria at nine o'clock for those people in Australia, outside of Australia, that will be um, difficult, but we will let you know when it does come online. Um, as I said, we do have some special orders of books. So if you've got a book that you've always wanted, please just email us hello at the Actics Bookshop and we'll see if we can get it for you. It's, we, we are struggling at the moment to get... Um, actually, I think you can't hear me. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, anyway, I, we're struggling at the moment to get um, books into the country given the COVID, but let's just see how we go. So if you send us... Um, uh, if you send us the order, it will. We'll see if we can get it through. Johnny is telling me it's at nine thirty, not nine o'clock. Sorry, Johnny, nine thirty. Um, this Thursday, uh, we have our first of our international. We thought as we're opening up, we should maybe open up uh, back to the rest of the world. So we've got Clancy Moore, who um, Aaron from um, Vokes and Peters recommended we should have, and I've. Um, they had a fantastic opportunity to get to know their work over the last couple of weeks and just absolutely very excited about having them on. Um, incredibly joyful and quirky and interesting and uh, engaging. So um, they're coming to us from Dublin on Thursday night, which is 9 a.m. their time. So while they're making themselves a cup of tea, we'll be pouring ourselves a glass of wine. But uh, nothing more to do other than to say, Philip, thank you very much. Let me transition across to you so everyone can see you again and we can just wave goodbye to you. Thank you, Philip. That was really fantastic. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, to everybody, um, Clancy Moore on Thursday night. We'll see you then. Thank you.